This morning, I want to give you just a few minutes this morning. I'm starting a new series, and I've preached this in a different concept, but this morning I'm going to try to preach a little bit about what's love got to do with it is the title of my series. Amen? What's love got to do with it? We're getting a little bit of ring up here, just a tad bit. And here's what I want you to think about. What's love got to do with it? Turn to somebody and say everything. Oh, come on. You can turn and tell them better than that. Everything. Turn around and tell them. Come on, tell two or three people. Come on. You can do that better. Somebody needs to know that they're... Everything about life develops around this quality of love that we not only receive, but we give. And the, what the, the song says, what the, goes round is love. Love makes the world go round is what the old song says. And I know that somebody said, well, Pastor, you're, you're using a lot of secular songs today. Um, I know I won't dress up like Tina Turner to sing What's Love Got to Do With It. Aren't you all thankful for that? <laughs> Hearty amens on that. That's the best amen I'll get all day. <laughs> but when you think about this idea of what's love got to do with it, and you realize that it's everything about our relationship with God and our relationship with others. In a world that's tearing itself apart with bitterness and hatred, with racism of all kinds, we see uh, literally uh, the, 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 the habits that are, that are destroying people. When, when a mother can take her child and be high on drugs and kill three of her children, suffocate them. What's wrong with this world? When, when, when I think about the, the things that are going on, that, that, that literally you will drive down the freeway because somebody takes your spot and gets, makes you one car late that you would drive up to them and shoot them through the car window and kill them? There's something wrong with this world we live in. They need to understand and they need to receive and know about the love of God. So today I'm going to, uh, my first part of this series and the first branch of this series will be uh, entitled, today's message will be about God's decision of defining what love is. You see, love is many different things. And, and if you will, there's a lot of different things that I'm going to say about different songs. But this idea of what's love got to do with it, well, I can tell you that love has everything to do with it. And sometimes we realize that love makes the world go round. It is true, love makes a difference, and love helps us to reach others. But to define what love is, it's defined in many different ways. That's why the song says, love is a many splendored thing. It's a glorious thing. It's a glamorous thing. How many of you have had a bad relationship before, and you said, love stinks? How many of you are saying that this morning, that love stinks? Some of, you, some of you just waved your hands and amen that big. So, Love, in the nature of it, defines us as to who we are. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about what the world says love is and what God says love is. And we need to know that if we can understand the difference between what the world says love is and what God says love is, it will change the way that we learn to love each other. Amen? If you look at this with me, I believe that love truly makes a difference and love truly is what God desires for us. Defining this nature of love, as we go on into this, we can see it, but I want you to turn in your Bibles and we'll be preaching from these a uh, couple of scriptures in this area. My text actually goes on down through the 1 John, the fourth chapter, and I'll be preaching out of 1 John. If you want to understand God's love greater, I will tell you this, the best thing you can do is get your Bibles and read the gospel of 1 John. Read 1 John and read it through. One of the themes that runs throughout that entire book is love. And it explains love. But this, in my text this morning, it says that in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Verse 16 says, And we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. There... I'm going to teach you a new song so you can remember this scripture. All right? Now, you have to sing it with me. Some of you may know it. All right? If you don't know it, you're going to learn it. 
see this. See, Dave's leaving the words up there so you can see it. All right. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. So, beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. Yeah. <laughs> that was a... No, 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 no. Now, wait a minute here. I did a solo right there. You're supposed to be helping me sing that. I want to hear Laura singing it in Spanish. I think we need to, we need to, I, I was going to practice that with you in Spanish, Laura, but I, after I heard me sing it in English, I did not want to try it in Spanish. Now, now, here's what I want you to do is, if you will understand this, that scripture speaks to us and tells us about God's love for us and our love for one another. And to define what love is, it's beginning to understand that God himself is love. God is love. In, in, in 1 John, we realize that God is love. It says, and for uh, love one another, for love is of God, and that we are born of God, and he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. We go on and we understand that a little bit more, but then again in verse 16 he says, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So the first thing that I want to tell you is, is that when we define love, we must understand the definition is God is love. Now somebody, I, I, as I was preparing this and between that and the news and some of the things that are going on in the world today, I begin to realize the fact is, is that we have a many misunderstood message of God and love. Because we understand that God is love, we think that God tolerates all the problems and the sins of this world. God doesn't. God hates sin, but He loves the sinner. The church hates sin, but we better not hate the sinner. Because when we hate the sinner, God does not abide in us. And the problem with it is, is we get that turned around, and we begin to hate the sinner, and we forget that God teaches us that we are to love the lost as He loves them. Come on. You can't truly minister effectively to someone if you don't love them. And learning to love them is learning to share the love of God. Listen, whether you believe it or not, God didn't love you because you were so cute and cuddly. God didn't love you because you were so lovable. God loved you because he loved the lost and dying world. God loved you and because God is love. And sometimes we realize in the Old Testament we speak about the, the, the severity of the wrath of God. And you know, you realize that the wrath of God only represents the tolerance of God's love? If the children of Israel would have listened to God in obedience to what He told them to do as they wandered in the wilderness and when they went in to, to, to defeat the enemy instead of doing what they felt like they wanted to do, come on. Well, we'll just take a little bit of this, and we'll tolerate this, and we'll tolerate that. The next thing you know, say, listen, you know what? Tell me, this is what the, what's wrong with the world today and the church today, is we have tolerated the secular world creeping into the church, and we have become no different than the world. And so, if we're truly going to understand the love of God, God will not tolerate a work of sin. We look at this and we begin to see this. Defining what love is. Love can be defined in many different ways. The world's confusion of love sometimes is the fact that love can be defined and we talk about it that we love someone with all of our heart. You know why we say that? Because it sounds a lot better than I love you with all my kidney. Oh, baby, I love you. You make my liver quiver. Come on. No, we don't say that. We say, I love you with all of my heart because the heart is the main source that produces the blood that travels through all of our body. Every part of our body, blood flows through and, and sometimes we have to have devices to help the blood flow because it gets stuck. It, it doesn't go to our feet right. 
Anybody got neuropathy in your feet where you don't get that feeling that goes down there? And sometimes the toes and fingers and, and they have to, they, uh, never mind, nobody in here is like that. But love can be defined in so many different ways. The trouble with the world is, is that it tries to define love as sexuality. If you love someone, and, and many times in, in young relationships, they involve that and they become, if you love me, you will do this, and if you love me, you will do that. And the other concept of that is, is love is not defined in Scripture and has no definition in Scripture in the Bible about sexuality and love. But we have in this world created love to represent sexuality, and it doesn't. God loves you whether you're man or woman. Amen? I won't meddle there, but I tell you, if you don't know what you are, call the doctor. It is a strong, the Bible, listen, I looked it up and I, Hal, I wanted to know what the real definition was. I looked it up. It's a strong affection or an attachment to someone or something. Now, how many of you have a strong attachment to chocolate? Brother Bledsoe does. I know he admitted this a few years ago that he, he, he is a, a chocoholic. Still, you still a chocolate? It's not affection. It, it's, it's the chocolate is the sixth level. Good. Okay. So I'm here. Here. Here's what. Here's what we, we, have, we know is that we can be attached to a lot of things. And when we, we demonstrate that and we begin to talk about that, that's why love does not have to be sexual in the relationship of it. And I can tell you that the reason that so many people are mixed up in this world about their sexuality and love is because they don't understand it. I can tell a brother in Christ that I love them without committing any kind of a sin. And it doesn't have to be sexual to say I love them. I have a strong affection and attachment to them. Pastor, we're calling the authorities. I can tell you this. The strong attachment and the feelings that I have and the love is the same love that I know God has for me. And that attachment represents so much more. It doesn't have to be confined to the nature of the bedroom. Somebody say amen. Passion, though, is a result of our love because passion is actually the expression of our love. It is an action towards or what or who we love. Scripture defines love in a totally different way of what Webster does or Google or whoever you look to to find out definitions. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, go ahead, Dave, and pull that up. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, defines love as this, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy and love does not parade itself and is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in the iniquities, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. If you, listen... You're here today, and you are looking to, for a companion to be, or maybe you're dating, or you're just praying for one to come into existence. You need to, you need to memorize this scripture. You know what I tell most people, and some of you I've counseled with in this premarital counseling, I tell them this all the time. You need to print this up and put it on the most popular place in your house, the refrigerator. But you need to put this up and you need to read this and define this because love and marriage are 100% give. It's not about what I get back. It's what I can give to the other person. To be in love gives us the understanding that we understand the love that God has and we understand that love never fails. Reading the, through those things and sometimes when, when I read those things, I, I like to point out my wife that she misses a couple of those. And she tells me this all the time, that I, I miss a lot of those things. But here's the problem that we have. This is the true meaning of what God is. Love, in that definition, God suffers long and is kind. 
God does not envy. God does not parade Himself. God is not puffed up. If you substitute that word and you begin to fill that in, then you can see why God is designed and defined in Scripture to say that He is love. Because all of those things bring us up to the understanding of God's love to us. Aren't you glad God is long-suffering to us? Aren't you glad that God doesn't lord over us? Or rejoice at our problems and our circumstances? But He picks us up and loves us in spite of it? God is love. God is love. And God then in us begins to teach us and train us that we are to love others. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. If you go to verse 1, it speaks in, in this nature. And I'll speak to the church in this fashion. So buckle your seatbelts for just a second. If you're a believer, you need to understand that just because you're a believer doesn't mean that love oozes out of you. Come on. Stay with me. In 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, it says, Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but I have not love. I have become sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. That scripture speaks volumes to us as the church because what the church has tried to do is we have tried to come together and we, we learn to love each other. Come on. Just, I mean, look around this room. There, we are brothers and sisters and we've talked about it and we love each other and, and we, 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 we even love the rotten ones, Bob. You know, we, we love those and, and sometimes they're, and we learn to love brothers and sisters and we can do that. But you know what? God says that we're to love outside of our own. And we just don't love those who love us. We love those who are hurting and broken because God loved us in that same way. Now let me go on. Go ahead, Dave, and bring that next one up. Defining love. Defining love, and, and I'm going to be preaching this for the next few weeks, and this week I want to try to hit to the first two. The love is giving. The nature of that is, is that I told you, Love, truly, by the de definition of it, is 100% give. Do you know that God loved us while we were yet sinners? God gave His Son while we were still lost. God loved us, but He hates the sin that destroys us, that controls us, and ruins our life. Love is giving. And secondly, love is sacrificial. Go ahead and pull those other two up. Love is eternal and external. And then finally, love is perfected. When we look at those first two, I'm going to be preaching about those two this morning. Love is giving. Defining love is giving love. And love is giving in the nature of it. If you look at God, God so loved us that He gave to us. God loves us. In 1 John 4, uh, the, the verses 9 and 10, and it says, And this is love that, that was manifested towards us, that God had sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He came to be the stead between us and hell. And He loved us so much, and He loved, us, he loved this creation that He has. Now I want you to look at somebody, look them right in the eyes, and tell them with your best word, God loves you. God loves you. God even loves you, a rotten teenager. God loves you. God loves you. God, we need, you need to tell them that God loves you, and you need, you need to demonstrate it to the world. God is love, and God loves you. Let me tell you something that will change somebody's mind and change somebody's attitude towards you. Just say God loves you, and I love you. Come on. Did, did anybody tell you, Martin, that God loves you? Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Chuck, even God loves you. Amen. It's not that hard to demonstrate, the, to, to change the world 
It starts with you telling people that you love them. And, and, and I, don't, I don't love everything that everybody does. Now, honey, you know, I'm just saying. I'll talk to Don over here. Oh, I love you. I don't love everything that Don does. He's a crook sometimes, but I love him. I love his pancakes, too. <laughs> Though everybody ate the blueberry when before I got a chance to get any. But God loves us, and God became the stead, and God said, I love you so much that I will give to you everything that I own, everything that I am, I give to you. God sent his best possession, and that was his son. To God didn't give you the leftovers. Come on, some of us, when we give to God, we give God leftovers. Come on. Well, God, I'll pay my tithe with whatever I got left, and if I don't have anything left, God, you understand Mm-hmm. If you were dating somebody and you wanted to impress them, you would give them your best, wouldn't you? Come on now, let's just do this. Hun, when I was dating you, I, I gave you my best. <laughs> it wasn't much, but it was my best. And you see how impressed she was. Man, just ruined my message right there. I'm going to go. Okay. Blew it right there. Hun, why don't you go help Children's Church? I think they need you over there. So. They. But if you realize this nature of what you do, you give God your best. Come on. I never will forget uh, when I, uh, the first time that I was taking a girl to the prom. It wasn't my wife. This was when I was much, much younger, hun. And I remember I had a 71 Gremlin that had more rust than paint. And it was held together by wire. And, and, I, and I was thinking, I've got this, to, I want to impress this girl. And I looked at my car and I said, she would have to climb in on the driver's side because you open the passenger door, it would fall off the hinges because it was wired shut. My dad had a really cool, really nice looking with the big wheels, nice setup in a 72 Mustang. And it was nice. And it was all detailed out and it was silver and it was nice. And I told dad, I said, dad, I'm taking a girl to the prom and I, I really want to impress her. He said, I suggest you start cleaning that thing now. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I, I, I want to I borrow your car because I want to I impress her. So I, 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 I picked her up in the Mustang, and she thought, whoa, you know, he's, look at this. He's got a nice car. And then she found out I didn't have no money, and she didn't want nothing to do with me again. <laughs> but you know what? God knows everything there is to know about you. And what you can do is offer yourself back to him. Do you realize God doesn't expect the best from you? He expects what you have to offer to him. That's why he said if you'll give him the first of the fruits, both of your worship, finances, and God says, then I'll bless the rest. Come on. This is good preaching whether you like it or not. If we don't say we love God and then rob him, what kind of people are we? Oh, this is preaching, and I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go home and watch this one again. <laughs> Amen. Ben, get it out there in a hurry. The reason that we understand it and the reason that God ties and tithes with our offering, listen, God doesn't need your money. Do you understand that? God is not sitting there saying, oh, if they don't give to me, I'm going to be broke this week. You know what God says? If they give to me, it's because they love me. It's, it's because they love me. It, listen, this morning, if, you, if you're waiting to, for God to do the miracles that you're praying for and God to do the amazing things that you're asking him for and you wait till then to praise him, what good is that? But if you praise him now, you offer him the best that you have. Come on. God wants that. And if we'll offer it to him, God says that he will respond in the nature of who he is, and that is love. Go on, God 
God's love for us is that he gave first. God gave first to us in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. God loved us. God loved you. And God has never stopped loving you. And though today maybe you've got sin in your life, maybe there's some things in your life that you need to deal with and some things that you need to stay set straight with God and ask God to forgive you of. But He loves you. And He never stopped loving you. And though sometimes the sin separates us from God and we, we think you, maybe you're sitting here today with the guilt in, in your heart. But God says, I love you. I love you. I love you. There's a little chorus that says, Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how He loves you. Oh, how He loves me. Oh, how He loves you and me. Lord, thank You for loving me. Thank You for loving me. Thank You for loving each of us today, God. Thank You for loving us so much, God, that You, you gave Your Son first. And, and we didn't have to line up to be perfect. You sent Your Son, even while we were living in this nature of sin, to remove the sin that separates us from your love. God, you love us. You love us. You love us. This morning, maybe you're struggling with this nature. Could God really love a lost sinner like me? I know that there was a time when I had removed myself from God. I had I'd separated. I had I'd gone down a path of rebellion. And I, I said, God, I don't want anything to do with you if you're going to let these kind of terrible things go on in the world. And God says, son, I love you. And he reached to me over and over and over again. But in my rebellious state, when I separated myself from God, God still pursued me with love. Sometimes we have a hard time realizing that God loves us because He has to get our attention to turn our eyes and our hearts towards Him. But love in the nature of it is God and God is love and love is giving. Love is sacrificially giving. Love is the nature of who God is and giving that that we have to God. You see, God sacrificed His Son for the love that He showed to us. You realize that you and I could not be saved? No matter how much we gave, no matter how much we did, no matter what the things that we tried to work to be, we could not save ourselves. But God sacrificed His only Son. And love is sacrificial. Love is putting others before yourself. Love is putting others before yourself. Let's say that again. Love is putting others before yourself. In a self-centered, self-driven world of pleasure-oriented nature, we want that because it feels good and makes me happy. Come on. Happiness has little to do with the nature of love. Come on. Because there are some times when you realize that sacrificially, it is better for you to please the one that you love than it is to get it yourself. Amen? And it's putting others before yourself. God loved us and put us before himself. And he sacrificed his only son. Go ahead and pull that scripture up. It says, greater love is this than, than, than one would lay down his life for his friends. The nature of that is Jesus speaking to us, telling us that he loved us so much. And he loved his friends and he loved those that he was traveling with, those disciples that he had spent three years with. He said, I love you so much that I am going to die for you. And that scripture, though it talks about Jesus in the nature that he would lay down his life, if you put someone before yourself, would you sacrifice yourself before them? Come on. In the nature of that, in, in my love. Now, come on. We a lot of times would lay down our life for those who 
do good stuff for us. Come on. God sent his son to die for us while we were separated from him. And sometimes it's easy for us to, to create. The, we, we love the nice people. Sometimes it's harder for us to love those who are bitter and angry. Those who are confused and, and misled. And sometimes we've got to understand this, that God loves us and he wants us to love others. And Christ, in the nature of that, loves it. That's one of the reasons why when I think about those who sign up to serve in the military, it is a sacrificial love. They are signing their name on the line, knowing that at any moment in their military service, their life could be taken. But yet they put their life on the line. Police officers do the same thing. When they patrolling those streets, they sign up to put their life on the line to protect you and I. You can, I know there's some bad ones out there. I, don't get me started on that. I know there's, there's some guys that serve in the military that are only about a paycheck. There's some police officers that try to take advantage of the system. There's politicians that always take... No, I'm just... Anyway... I will tell you this, when somebody puts their life, I respect them, and I tell, on any time, I was at, I was at a, a store the other day, and the officers came in, they were getting some food, and the restaurant gave them the food, and one guy standing back behind me goes, look at them guys, they're just in here to get free food, and I just listened to him complain a little bit, and then when... Those guys turned around, they walked by out of line and said, thank you so much. So much safer knowing that you're here to protect me. Thank you. I respect who you are. You say, well, Pastor, what'd you do? Speed all the way there? And you no. I know this. That I thank the Lord that there are those that sacrifice themselves. I thank the Lord that, there, that my wife, I know this, that she would sacrifice herself for me. She's, she sacrificed for, so that I can, can, can have the opportunities. And, and we sacrifice for each other because we love each other. What's that one song that says, oh, come on, you guys know it. It's, I would take a grenade for you. You know? Anybody, you heard that, ain't you? What are you doing listening to that kind of music? Man, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and we talk about that as being sacrificial. And if the secular world realizes the importance of that, how much more should the church be that way? We didn't want to come to church if it's too hot, too cold. Come on, you give the reason. You can fill in the blank. But God loved you. When you weren't so lovable, and God gave his son for you, and in return of me, would you love me back? And the way that we do that is by giving of ourselves. The Bible tells us here, 1 John, the third chapter, it says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Greatest example of love is Christ giving his life on a cross for those who simply rejected him. There were those in the crowd, though, that day who loved him and had spent time with him. They saw him as he was innocently portrayed as guilty. Though he had never done a crime, was crucified for the crimes of all of us. Had never committed a sin, but yet was crucified for the sin of all mankind. The sacrifice of love was one who was innocent, became the guilty for us who were lost. That sacrifice of love teaches us that we put others before ourselves because we love them. Sometimes in a self-centered world that we live in, we think about how's it going to benefit me and what am I going to get out of it? Instead of thinking, God, how can I demonstrate this love to a world that needs loved. Roberto, if you'll come and get ready to play. Naomi, if you want to come and sing.
I don't know. Maybe, and I feel this in my heart. I felt this this morning before I started this message. There are some people that have been hurt. You are, you are hurt over a circumstance in a relationship, and you are hurt. You are hurting this morning. A love that, that went the wrong way. And you feel like that, you feel like that love is very difficult this morning. And talking about how that you're supposed to give to love. You see, one that sacrifices love is you don't have to wait till they apologize. Be bigger than that. Even though you're the one who was, was done wrong, still apologize. Putting the other first. Learning to love in that way. To say that I love you. To say that the demonstration of it. It's not enough. Just to say, I love you. I tell Joe this all the time. He's walking out after he says, Dad, give me 20. And then he says, I'm going to see Gabby. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go, I'm going to go play back. And, and, and he's on his way out the door and he says, I love you. And then he turns around and he hollers it again. I love you. And I said, get out of here. You robbed me. You're running away from me. If you loved me, you'd stay here and spend some time with me. But, Dad, you know I love you. But I want to go see Gabby anyways. And so on his way out, I said, Son, I'll never let you leave without you knowing that I love you. But I do want to spend time with you. I don't, I don't understand teenagers. I was one once, believe it or not. Believe it or not, at one time, y'all. I know, James, it's a long time ago. I understand how priorities happen. But love through that. Come on, amen. Love them, love them in, in their differences because they don't have to look like me. And thank goodness they don't have to act like me. Come on. We love because God loved us. We love others because God teaches us to love others.